there was nothing that was going to stop me from doing what I wanted to do. I mean, I was like dunking on people left and right. Uh, pretty much, I, I, they were at my mercy. For sure. I remember that, man. Those first few years professionally are tough. I remember my first job was in Canada for 1600 a month. Ooh, man, yeah. I'm lucky. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, everyone. This is the Ike Max Podcast. Once again, thank you all for being here with us today. Today, we had the special privilege of interviewing Ira Lee Brown, a well-known player here in Japan, just an overall really, really nice guy. He's got a heart of gold, a fierce competitor. He's always been the underdog in his life, and just being able to hear his story and share his experiences with us today was just an amazing thing. Yeah, he was a two-sport athlete. He was drafted in the Major League Baseball and ended up paying $100 to play in Mexico and auditioned to play professional basketball and ended up in Japan and becoming an all-star player. For sure. It was an honor and a privilege once again to have interviewed him and it was nice of him to take the time and we really hope you guys enjoy hearing your story. It's the true story of an underdog coming up on top. Should I go and throw a hat on because my, my hair looking that bad? <laughs> You look great, man. Now you good. You look about as, about as good as you're going to get. <laughs> All right, we have a special episode. We have Ira Brown, a uh, former uh, Gonzaga Bulldog, and he's a two-sport athlete, and he's played in Japan for nine years. He's 38 years old, but still dunking on people. Amazing. What you mean? Am I 38? I didn't know that. I'm sorry. Oh, we'll keep you at 28. <laughs> Hey, my um, man, that's what, that's what I like to hear right there. Yeah, welcome on. Thanks, thanks oh, for coming on. Thanks for having me on. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me on, bro. All right, so uh, we want to get into uh, your two-sport um, athlete uh, career. How did that get started, and why did you end up choosing basketball at the end? Well, uh, I, I grew up playing all sports when I was, when I was a kid. Uh, family is pretty much athletes. Uh, it's pretty much the only thing that we knew. Uh, academics were not um, a big deal, to be honest. Um, so uh, with that, I chose the side of baseball because I just excelled in it, uh, was just outstanding. Um, did a lot of travel teams, did it year round. Um, then when I was in high, out of high school, I got drafted by the Kansas City Royals. Uh, so I decided to give myself a five-year window to make it to the majors and um just uh, dealing with many different coaches and also the system itself um, just fell out of love with the game. Uh, it was considered work then, so no longer had the passion to play. And so when I decided to go back uh, to play basketball, I started out at a community college in Phoenix, Arizona, um, which is uh, the, Phoenix, the Phoenix College Bears. Uh, so got started there with basketball and got a full ride scholarship there for two years and then got offered two year full scholarship uh, to go to Gonzaga amongst other schools. But I chose uh, Gonzaga because that was a school in which um, I was somewhat familiar with being uh, having played in Spokane, Washington for the uh, Spokane Indians and also just knowing a lot of people in that area. So I decided to uh, go to Gonzaga and for two years and did okay. I mean, didn't get tons of time, but uh, I mean, um, it is what it is. But uh, that motivated me to pursue um, um, my college, uh, after college uh, professional career uh, overseas. But so just to rewind it back a bit though, Ira, how is it pivoting from being in baseball shape to going back to then being in basketball shape. That's a that's a difficult thing, right? Uh, to me, it was, yeah, it was difficult because I was never taught uh, the skills of basketball. I was just a, a freak athlete, to be honest. Um, you throw the ball anywhere around the rim, I was pretty much dunking. It couldn't shoot uh, a rock in the ocean, to be honest. So, uh, But, I mean, I learned all those skills. I worked out with uh, Frank Johnson and Eddie Johnson, um, who played for the Phoenix Suns some time ago and then also Jared Bayless at the time and Ike Diagu and all those guys, uh, the Fontenet brothers who played at, um, uh, university of uh, Oregon. And so, I mean, it was a tough, it was a tough road. And I mean, I, I was committed to it because I understood the, the financial, uh, gain that I could uh, have from it. And, and, uh, 
So, I mean, I committed at least uh, 14 hours of my day to basketball. And so, obviously, the transition was very difficult because you got to really, really, um, being that far behind, you got to really, really dial in uh, every single day to uh, and be committed to whatever uh, success you're willing to uh, gain from it. So going from college basketball into becoming a professional basketball player, um, what was your first experience like playing in, uh, professionally overseas? Uh, basketball? Yeah. <laughs> My first experience, uh, obviously, I, it was a tough road for me, first of all, to get, get going. Um, I started out uh, going on like this traveling team because I couldn't get any offers going on a traveling team throughout Mexico. And so when I went through the traveling team throughout Mexico, um, we, they only paid us a hundred dollars to, to do so. Actually, as a matter of fact, I had to pay a hundred dollars uh, to go through this traveling team. But then, yeah. But then uh, with that, I did extremely well because I knew um, that I didn't want my coaches from Gonzaga because they called me older for one. And I didn't want my coach coach from Gonzaga to, to be right about it, about me not being able to play overseas or, or about my career being done. And so me having the drive, I did extremely well throughout the, uh, throughout the uh, traveling camp or whatever. And then after that, the offer started coming. And um, I mean, my max offer was $2,500 uh, for, t- from the peak in IRD. I mean, that's a lot less than what most people will make. But I mean, I knew that I had to bite the bullet in order to just get my foot in the door. Once I got my foot in the door, I knew the rest was up to me. But once I played the first professional game, I mean, there was nothing that was going to stop me from doing what I wanted to do. I mean, I was like dunking on people left and right. Uh, pretty much, I, I they were at my mercy. For sure. I remember that, man. Those first few years professionally are tough. I remember my first job was in Canada for 1600 a month. Ooh. Man, yeah. I'm lucky. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Humble beginnings. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> Man, that's, that's what's up. I did not know that. Yeah. So yeah. now you're nine years in in Japan. Um, what made you stay here so long? Uh, well, it was the fact that when I first came into uh, Japan, I loved the, co- the country. Um, a friend of mine was the one who got me over here. He was in my... Um, in my sports management class, me, Rob, and all those guys, uh, we all had the same class. Uh, his name um, was Ryohei kind of guy. He, I think he's a manager for uh, Fukushima now, maybe, uh, Firebond. And so we were all really good friends. And he had called me up and, and was uh, asking me if I was uh, interested in coming over here. And I heard a lot about Japan at the time from Corey Violet and uh, Casey Calvary and Richie from they had all, all played over here, former Zags played over here. And so I was like, sure, I'll take the offer of five grand um, a month. And I was making a lot less. I was making more when I was in um, the Philippines and could have made more uh, elsewhere. But at the same time, I heard that it was a great market over here. And so I just wanted to come over and, and get tapped in. And once I got tapped in, I was I fell in love with the culture, the onsen, like the re- respect that the people had for one another. Um, like, of course, I, I'm a diehard fan of sumo. So uh, just a lot of different things that, that made, really made me fall in love with the culture. And then obviously me uh, finding a special lady um, whom I later married, um, I want to say my, my second or third, my third year, actually. And so with that, I uh, decided to just stay and it's been home ever since. But. So you came in BJ League. What team was it? I was with uh, Toyama Grouses. And we were way below 500 uh, team. I mean, the team was just terrible. But uh, luckily, I was a part of uh, turning that organization around, um, just as, I, as I've been with many other organizations as well. Uh, I've been having a privilege to do so and, and will continue to, to enjoy that privilege. You played with a very close friend of mine, uh, Brian Harper, back in those days. I did. Huh? <laughs> Sticks. My man Sticks. We call him Stretch. <laughs> man, he's, I, I showed him some videos of what you're doing now, and he's like, that's unbelievable. He's like, oh. his game has expanded so much more since those Hoyama days. Oh, yeah. It was fun going against uh, B. Harper. I mean, we used to dunk on each other left or right. B. Harper was a good 6'9", six, 6'10", six, and they, they could shoot the thing and handle it and all that type of stuff. So it was, it was a fun battles with him for sure. 
Uh, you just briefly touched upon how you fell in love with onsens out here, hot springs for people who don't know. Um, is that part of your uh, rehab routine after um, games? The cold, go, the cold I, plunge. Oh yeah, I go there. I go to the onsen because we have a, a sponsor here at least uh, four times a week. I mean, I eat my dinner there. I mean, I, it's like literally a, a routine now being single. So it's like, you just don't have, I mean, I don't have that luxury that uh, big Ike have over there. So uh, <laughs> having that hot, cold, fresh meal when you get out and get, get home from the court and kids over there, daddy, daddy, I love you and all this type of stuff. But <laughs> no, I'm proud of you, brother. But no, nah, no, nah, that's I, the only thing I absolutely love it because it's like it helps with recovery, relaxes me. Um, keeps keeps the blood flowing. Um, I mean, it's just like the hot tub, cold tub does so much. It's, honestly, it's like magic. Do you have a specific routine? Is it uh, three minutes hot, two minutes cold, two minutes hot, one minute cold? Or is that kind of how I you do, go about uh, it? I do five minutes uh, hot and cold uh, three times. Oh, you're different than me. I do, I do 10 minutes hot, 10 minutes cold, five hot, five cold. <laughs> I ain't sitting in that cold tub back that long. I, mean, I, I, I do a lot of contact, man. <laughs> <laughs> I play a physical style of basketball. <laughs> and you and you got a little bit more uh, skin than I do over there. Your, your skin's a little bit thicker down there in, uh, in Georgia. <laughs> Are there any, any other tools that you use to um, get yourself prepared uh, other than onsens? Um, man, I have... I mean, I, I honestly learned a lot from uh, Jr. Uh, Sakuragi. So I mean, shoot, I have I have a therapeutic, uh, whatever you want to call it, here in my own home. <laughs> I have like your recovery pants. I have uh, your MCR Michael Kern. I have like the uh, infrared heaters. I have like literally anything that you can imagine when in terms of recovery. Um, that I that I use uh, on the on the regular, just so I can, because I, I like to be professional. Honestly, like whenever whenever I'm done playing basketball, then I can just really really enjoy life. Uh, but when it comes to being professional, I do all I possibly can do to to keep myself on the court, and I uh, take the proper vitamins and and eat pretty clean uh, for the most part. And so, Ira, let's uh, take it back a bit. So you leave Toyama, you find the lady that you would uh, go on to marry. What made you go about the process of trying to get your Japanese passport? Uh, just the fact that the uh, national team had approached me um, because they heard that uh, I was engaged to marry a Japanese. And so when they approached me, um, they were like, hey, we'll help you get your passport. We want you to play for the national team. And um, once that happened, then that's when we... Uh, we began the process because at that time you can become a naturalized player when you just simply just begin the process. You didn't necessarily even have to have the uh, passport, but now currently you have to have the passport in order to play as a naturalized player. And so that's what made me uh, apply for the passport. Other than that, I, I mean, I had no desire to, to stay because my wife and I at the time, my ex-wife at the time we had planned on moving back to the States and until her family had gotten older and then uh, we'll come back here and or either move her family to the States in order to to take care of her family. Because I love what I love most about Japan. And, and I strongly desire to do this whenever I'm um, when I'm back when I'm back in the States, if I choose to live there for the rest of my life, um, is the fact that they really, really take care of the elderly people. Uh, they move them in and and. Um, and allow them to live in their home and everything. So, I mean, it's just a lot. I think it's a beautiful life because, I mean, you got to understand, it's like our, our parents took care of us when we were kids. And, that, and I'm sure, obviously, they were complaining. They didn't like it. But, I mean, at the same time, it's like we have to do what's right in, in, in life and take care of them as well because they did so for us. And so uh, how was that national team experience? Because when you first played for the national team, that was uh, during the time where Japan was going to the transition of being one of the the least or not very good Japanese team, I mean, uh, Asian teams to kind of ascending a bit. Uh, honestly, like it was the environment there was was like a being your a graveyard, to be honest with you. Uh, I mean, no one liked to be there. They would 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 much have rather been uh, played with their teams uh, because obviously their teams were playing money. The national team wasn't playing money. 
uh, no guarantee for sponsor money or anything like that. So people really, really disliked being with the national team. Um, and I, I mean, I can name, I can say so many names, but I don't want to call out names, but I mean, I had, I came in and changed, uh, the environment and just like t- turned into more fun and, uh, like, just like, Hey, like it's a, it's a privilege to play for your national team. It's not an obligation or I, or I feel obligated because they're calling me. No, let's, let's make this thing fun and let's win, beat up on some teams that uh, we've never beaten in a while or ever beaten. And so it just became more of a fun environment to be in. And then obviously um, once Fizika's has got his passport, uh, they gladly expo- uh, got rid of me. And, and then, uh, which, I mean, I felt bad for because of the fact that it's like, I worked hard to get to get the guys where they were. And, and like for, for me to feel as if, as if like I was uh, easily disposable was, I mean, it wasn't a great feeling because I mean, I helped did a lot for the national team. And, and so obviously Fazekas did uh, more, which I'm very happy for that uh, he came in and also had success with uh, the national team, but just as well as he was disposable. I mean, but that's uh, a, that's a else. testament to you though, Thanks because You've always been known as like an undersized guy in this and on that international stage, it's even more so because I can imagine amongst the guys with a passports, you were probably the smallest player, but you were still competing at such a high level. It's a testament to the work that you've put in. No, I agree because it's like with me, it's like I don't care what size you are, whether you're six ten, seven seven foot or my size. Like my job is to if you have more skill than me, then prove it. Like I'm going to outwork you. I'm going to get to where I want to get uh, my spots and, and and I'm not going to let you get to your spot. And so to me, it's like, it's just all about the test of a wheel, the wheel that in which you have within yourself. And so I'm just, when it comes to that, I'm a bulldog and I, I love to fight. I love to battle. Um, and I love to, for most of all, prove people wrong. And so that's, that's why I grind and that's why I do what I do. What have you seen in the nine years that you've been here in terms of the growth in Japanese basketball? You know, the, the talent, I'm sure, has grown. Uh, you have young players like Rui Hachimura and Watanabe in the NBA. Um, Togashi is, is killing it right now. Uh, what are your thoughts about that? I mean, those guys, <laughs> I remember playing against uh, Togashi when he was at Akita. He just came on the scene, and, and obviously he was pretty dang good then. But, I mean, his maturity his maturity of the game is, is unreal. I, I literally just watched him score 40, 40 points on Toyama. And uh, I mean, the efficiency in which he's done it, I mean, that's exceptional. I mean, <laughs> he, I like when I was with the national team, I literally called, I like his nickname to me, to, for me was a uh, giant killer. Cause I mean, he would low you to sleep, low you to sleep, pop, and then just literally just pop a three in your eye. Or either just flow game, passing game. He's he, his game is uh, significantly improved, and obviously with Rui working out with him, um, with the, starting with the national team, and then also with Gonzaga in the summers, um, the kid is just unbelievable. I mean, I've never playing against him with with the national team. I've never played against a player that can constantly that shoot over me because I have pretty good timing when it comes to blocking shots and stuff, but. I mean, he shoots the dang ball so high and he either just gets the roll or the ball just drops in. So his IQ of the game, he has such a great feel for the game. And and I mean, the sky is out the absolute limit for him. He's he's going to be special eventually. Uh, he actually, he already is. <laughs> uh, so, um, but I think uh, he's going to have a tremendous success in the NBA. Watanabe, I don't really know too much about, but I mean, um, Japan basketball has improved a lot. I mean, with Baba, uh, Udai Baba, I mean, how hard he's worked. I remember him back in the Toyama days when when he was when he was uh, coming to the gym and challenged me to play one on one. So I mean, like we were all in that little area, me, Baba, and uh, and Rui. Uh, I knew I knew Rui's dad, um, Thomas. Um, we used to actually go and have drinks whenever I was in uh, in Toyama and stuff. So it's just so funny how like now all these guys are or having so much success in basketball, but they've worked extremely hard and they're well-deserving of it. And I'm sure Japan basketball is is in great hands because, I mean, there's a lot of young talent coming up. Yeah, that's my question. So as far as the B-League, who are some of the uh, Japanese guys that have impressed you the most over the past nine years? Um, Obviously, 
Togashi, Hiojima continues to impress me. If he had more of a dog in him, good Lord. That kid could be Unstoppable. For sure. <laughs> he's the most skilled. He's one of the most skilled players I have ever seen. He can do anything. He, he really can. Handling, I mean, just... I called him the magic man when I was with the national team because he, he was that elusive uh, on the court. Um, and then um, Kanamaru, the way that he, his ability to shoot... I mean, I've never seen anybody shoot as well as he does. It's effortless. I mean, it's effortless. And every time it leaves his hand, it's like it, it's like it's going in. Like if you don't block it, it's going in. And so just by watching him over the years, um, and then um who else? Um Hashimoto, uh the um, we we have a player Taka, Hashimoto Takia. He's a, fresh, a special player. I love how hard he plays both offense and defensively. Um, I mean Kai Taves. Uh, the fact that he's he's as tall as he is, being like six three maybe, but uh, with with such a, a strong handle and, and a great feel for the game. Uh, Leo Ben Draman, in which I had with me uh, working out in um, at Gonzaga. And when I took him to Gonzaga, and this was when I was playing for the for Hitachi, he killed all the Gonzaga players. I mean, killed them. They were trying to figure out who the heck he was. And I was like, oh, yeah, that's my little rookie or whatever. And he worked out with David Stockton and everything. And so, I mean, it was like when I had him there. But it just shows you how talented that, that these guys really can be if they have the IQ of, over, of an over, overseas players. Because those the the players in which I've named those players are literally they have different mentalities in terms of not falling in line of wanting to be that superstar and and or just simply just having the um, American IQ or American style of play. A lot of players have it in this league, and um, but the coaches re- restrain them from being who they really are. And to me, I think that's sad. And some of the guys that you've mentioned also have gone and went off to play internationally. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, so Dirt, now you've gone to many teams, uh, various teams. Which stop did you enjoy the most? Um, Maybe the city or? Well, honestly, by far, Okinawa was probably the best experience. Just uh, overall, I mean, Okinawa just. I mean, just the living. I mean, I had a three-bedroom apartment, uh, American style, uh, a lot of space overlooking the beach. Um, And I felt like, honestly, just by living there, tons of Americans and and everything there, like every time I came in back into Maine, I felt like a foreigner. Um, And so, but I mean, the organization itself, I can't tell you, man, I can't, that organization was just, very everybody respected one another it was like a family like literally like i loved everything about that organization and so uh and also the city the people the locals i mean everybody was great i mean toyama was was a great stop as well very very family oriented um osaka osaka has been good also um but i mean to me it's like this this city has so much potential I mean, so much potential. And they don't really know how much potential that they really have. Um, It can really, really be great because, I mean, it's a big city and uh, it's the organization itself has great money. Yeah, I agree. Just Osaka, the city itself, the fan support that they could generate, I really feel like it's a hidden gem. I, I think they really, I agree with you, they don't understand the potential that they have there just simply because of the, the amount of fan support that they could get and the kind of players that will be attracted to a city like that. Right, absolutely. And I experienced it last year because obviously last year was my first year here and we had tons of success. We were number two. Well, we were number two in our, our overall in our conference, but we were at least a top four to five team in the whole entire league. And so all the fans started coming back around, uh, and then, um, like we we were what one game out of being winning our conference, and that was uh, that was halted due to COVID. But we had more wins on Okinawa, um, 
And so uh, if COVID didn't stop us, I strongly believe that we would have uh, been number one in our conference. Okay, so speaking to the changes that have happened this year, it seems as though, considering the past few years, you found the fountain of youth again this year because, I mean, you've been playing at a really, really high level this year. I'm a very motivated, driven type of person. And one thing I do, I hate losing. I hate losing more than anything in the world. So if I got to sacrifice whatever I got to sacrifice in order to get a win, then so be it. So that's just my mentality. I mean, is it, is so it more like so that you've been given more that you had to take on a bigger role this year? Or is it just that you feel really good? Like what, what what's it been? What's been the motivating factor there? Uh, just obviously it's contract year just to prove people that um, I'm my age is my age, but that's not who I am. <laughs> Um, so just that in itself and, uh, me just wanting to get, uh, have the desire to get the biggest contract of my career, um, and then kind of go from there, figure things out. Uh, that's been a huge part of, it. we have a, a rookie coach this year because we had, uh, unfortunately our head coach, uh, was diagnosed with, uh, lymphoma cancer. who's doing much better, which is all the grace to God, uh, glory to God for that, um, that he's doing much better. So, um. So, um, so I just knew I had to step up and, and do more and, and bring out the uh, toy I'm and, and just, I mean, I, at this age, it's, it's hard on my body, but at the same time, I gladly welcome that challenge. Well, hopefully, uh, maybe in your second career, you can go into management and, uh, you know, help out these organizations with, uh, you know, the experience that you have, because it seems like to each stop that you've had, you've left the organization in a better place than when you came in. Yeah, I mean, that'd be great. It'll be something I would love to do. I even thought about being possibly a sports agent. Um, that's been my biggest thought, being a sports agent. And then um, with, because uh, obviously most agents get 10% of, of uh, whatever uh, their clients uh, make. And so with that, I thought about like taking a lot of the Japanese players, especially uh, to the States and having them working out at Gonzaga and or just having different stops to whereas they can experience uh, American basketball rather than only experiencing just a little bit and just have that creative mindset. Because I think that's the only thing that Japan basketball is really, really lacking is the creativity of the game. We have the structure down. The structure is easy, but it's just uh, the creativity that they need instead of the, the robotic mindset mindset. Yeah, I agree with you. I think having uh, more guys go internationally could really, really help push the B League and push ba uh, Japanese basketball forward. Because early on in uh, in America, with the way we're played, we're taught to have to facilitate and create for others and be able to create your own shot. And I think given the opportunity, a lot of guys that are here could do that. They just have never really been given the chance to do so. I agree with that. I agree with that. Because it's like, as I said, it's like earlier that uh, the coaches uh, – restrict them from doing a lot of things. And I think that to me, this is, that's, that's very sad for, for uh, that individual player, because I know, <laughs> I know a lot of players that can do so much. And, and at the same time, it's like, I listen to coach all the time. No, you just do this, or you just dribble the ball twice and you get rid of it. But you don't understand how creative this player really is. <laughs> like he's a special player. Like he's not like all the other players. And so it's just sad that, that, that coaches don't understand, um, to allow, allow the player to continue to have creativity in order for that player's long-term career and in order for him to be more, be more and more successful and to help the team. All right, so I want to pivot back to you for a second. Uh, you, you say your age is not a number and you're not defined by that. I agree a thousand percent. But your athletic ability that you've been able to carry into your late 30s, is, it's, it's miraculous. Like, what is it? What is it? Is it just that you were just a naturally athletic guy or is it weight training? Is it the way you eat? What, what keeps you performing at that level at the age that you are? Well, I think it's all the above, to be honest. Uh, God gifted There's a lot of it as well. Um, and just simply just having the desire to uh, continue to keep up with my body, whether it's uh, eating healthy, weight training, um, which I do three times a week. I uh, hadn't really done it with the schedule that we've had because obviously uh, 11 games in the, in the one month is a lot of games. Um, so I hadn't really got an opportunity to really get in there this month, but just um, doing all I possibly can to like stretching. I mean, 
I remember a guy when I was, uh, when I was uh, first coming up or whatever, because I never, when I got to the gym, I was just right on the court. Just didn't stretch, didn't do nothing. And he was like, man, in order for you to have a long career, staying flexible is, is key for you. And I didn't understand it until I got to about like maybe when I had my first injury uh, with the national team, like uh, we, we'd get off the planes and like go right away into practices and stuff. Uh, sometimes an hour and a half bus ride and, and, and all this type of stuff. And then you're practicing and then all of a sudden you're not having much time to stretch. You're just like on the floor and trying to go hard. And with me, it's like, obviously guys don't want to do it. So I kind of have to give that extra energy to like start dunking and like running hard to kind of get guys in the mood uh, to uh, just have fun and just enjoy the experience. And so my body got tight and I'm telling the trainers and everything like, hey, like uh, something's not feeling right. My legs are too tight. They're heavy, and all this type of stuff. And so they weren't really responding to what I would tell them. And so uh, sure enough, um, my my kneecap started pulling to the left. And I just, long story short, I had like uh, an arthroscopic knee, knee surgery, um, which was a small procedure. Uh, and so from that moment on, um, I was in the training, training room stretching, uh, getting massage, really, really every single avenue in which I, I had um, in terms of treatment, I was always u- using, utilizing it. And so uh, I think that's the most important. Most, most people think that, um, oh, I'm young. I, 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 won't, I won't get injured and all this type of stuff. I don't need to get a uh, massage. I don't need to stretch all this type of stuff. But trust me, it's, if you're not taking vitamins and all this type of stuff, it's the best thing that you can do for your career. All right, we're going to switch it up real quick. Uh, this is going to be the Mount Rushmore se- section of the podcast, and it's going to be your top four of whatever topic uh, we throw at you. Um, okay. Top four uh, Japanese snacks. He's a snacker in the off season. <laughs> no, the Japanese rice cakes with the white white sugar on them or whatever. Okay, yeah. Yes, number one, haichu. Number two, uh, what else outside of those that I really, really eat? Hmm. I don't know, and those are my main two, to be honest with you. <laughs> none of the none of the potato chips or not as much. No, I'm, I'm I don't really snack too much on potato chips. If I eat anything, it'd probably be Pringles. All right. Well, plug in two foods. Two foods. Oh man, like this is my yeah. Sushi is number one. Okonomiyaki, sukiyaki, uh, takoyaki. That's a good list. <laughs> man, I can go on and on and on. I mean, shabu shabu, man. So if anybody follows you on Instagram, they know that you take your meals very serious. And over the Absolutely. past few months, we have uh, witnessed you eat some very premium dining. Like t- walk us through some of those experiences because I saw you fishing and taking that fish to the plate. I also saw you right. eating some really, really premium uh, yakiniku. So let's talk about that a bit. Well, uh, like uh, one of the, one of my sponsors here in Osaka and also in Okinawa, they uh, they uh, first off, I love the fish. That's like once when I retire, if you want to find me anywhere, you will find me on a body of water somewhere. <laughs> so with that being said, uh, we went to uh, Awaji Shima uh, Island and we went fishing there. And so we caught uh, red snapper tie and then we call, also caught uh, booty. And so when we caught those particular fish and we had like a little bag going or whatever, that whoever caught the biggest fish, um, the opposite person would have to pay for the fish to get uh, sashimi and everything else and, and complete dined in. And so I ended up uh, like my, uh, my sponsor or my, I call him my big brother now because he's like a brother to me. Um, he, he, he's uh, the CEO for Hayama coffee. And so he, he catches a big fish. I mean, he has this thing hooked fish line and sink and he's just talking smack, just laughing and fighting and everything. Then all of a sudden, I think that I'm getting snagged by something. Like literally, the line just starts running. So I'm I'm videoing him, and all of a sudden, I drop my phone videoing him, <laughs> and and he pulls up his fish, and I'm still fighting my fish and everything, and my fish ends up being bigger than him. 
pig, <laughs> and he was sick. It took me about 25 to 30 minutes to finally reel this fish in. And so we had, we, t- we took that fish and got it sashimi and everything. And man, it was a delicious, delicious meal. And uh, I've done that from being in Okinawa to catching a 50, a uh, hundred pound uh, um, maguro, yellowfin tuna, and took that straight to the, uh, I mean, we, we fed a, a community with that thing. Uh, so I uh, gave a lot of fish away and I've caught uh, 55 tuna with uh, th- three other people before. Um, I mean, we were just pulling them out left and right and just took it straight to the, had a party that night and, and had sashimi uh, until we couldn't eat anymore. I mean, and then then going to, uh, I had that same gentleman from Okinawa come in town uh, when we played Mew Q, uh, the Golden Kings. And so I wanted I wanted to take him to one of the finest uh, places, uh, Yakiniku places here in um, uh, in Osaka. So all of a sudden, I like there's this place I really, really love to go to. And it's about, I pay $75 for all you can eat. And it's uh, premium, like uh, Kobe beef and, and is one with the $75 premium. And then with this uh, other premium uh, list that they have, which, which is like $100 a dish, um, well, for all you can eat. And like they have Wagyu beef, Kobe beef, all you can eat. And I mean, man, we had the best feast of our lives. I mean, the that meat just like literally just uh, melts in your mouth. It's like butter. I mean, man, I could I could literally taste it. Oh, trust me. If, <laughs> if you ever come here, I'll I'll treat you to it gladly. I appreciate it. Yeah, <laughs> I think we can all say that. Uh, I think food in Japan, the quality is much better than the states for it's, sure. There's, close. There's no comparison. <laughs> Zero comparison. I, I tell people all the time the difference between the states compared uh the state's food compared to here japanese food obviously you can look at the longevity of life with people and that that's a testament of not only the healthcare system but also just how great the food is they grow their own food and like literally they live off of what they grow as well and then just a regular market i mean there's they don't spray a lot of the not a lot of gmo food so it's like everything's based on seasons and everything and compared to america it's like so much stuff is gmo and, and like, to me, I think that me personally, I, I tell people all the time, it's like the food system is designed to either kill you slowly or to make you uh, have to um, use pharmaceutics. Yeah, I agree. Because if you go to Costco in Japan and you buy vegetables versus going to the local market and buying vegetables, the ones that you buy from the market, if you don't eat them in two or three days, then they're going to go bad. But you can yes, leave a yes. package sealed in Costco for a week. Two weeks yes, uh, and come back to it, and it's, it's just like you just bought it, and it just shows that the food here is held to a much higher standard. Absolutely, and I love that about Japan. I love it. Well, thanks for being so gracious with your time. Um, is there any last thing you want to plug in your your social media where people can reach you? Uh, yeah, if, I mean, if anybody want to reach me or, or follow me on Instagram, it's uh, Ira Brown forty four. Uh, love all the followers. I appreciate uh, you guys' time as well. It's been fun. Uh, so yeah, whenever you want to do it again, let me know. Yes, sir, man. Thank you. Thank you for the time. Uh, you're the most uh, second athletic IB in Japan right now, behind uh, Isaac Butts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, I to, uh, yeah, I saw those fingertip dunks that you've been I, doing. I had three dunks last game, by the way. <laughs> hey, Ira, that was my career high in one game. Seriously? See, oh, by a mile. I did, by a mile. <laughs> <laughs> I saw one of you barely got the ball over the rim. I was like, what is this? I, I, I had to force, a, I had to reach. Great. <laughs> I almost strained my back reaching that hard. <laughs> <laughs> All right, but once again, you guys, this has been the Ike Max Podcast. Thank you for uh, joining us today. Please like, comment, and subscribe. And once again, Ira Brown, thank you for taking the time, my man. Yeah, thanks for having me. I appreciate you guys. Yeah, thanks, Max. Nihon no kata, saigo mane go shichou itadaki, arigatou gozaimasu. Channel toruk, kouhyouka, yoroshiku, onegaishimasu.